Hi, I've just recorded a really important interview that you're going to want to watch because it's with Suzanne Trimbath, who is going to show you the dangers that exist in the stock market right now and how you can protect yourself. And the reason you want to watch this is because she is an insider. She used to work at the Federal Reserve and at the uh, clearing houses that, that uh, set, do all the settlement for the stocks and the stock certificates, which pretty much don't exist anymore. So you're going to watch this because she's also going to point out how you might be able to protect yourself. Enjoy the video. Hi, and welcome to this video. I've got a very special guest today, Suzanne Trimbath, the author of Naked, Short, and Greedy, and several other books. Suzanne, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, doing fine. How are you today? I'm doing great. Um, you know, I wanted to um, uh, first compliment you on your book. I have to be honest with the audience. I have not read the book yet but I did do a little bit of research and I went to amazon.com and I looked at the, the rating that you've got on this book and it's a 4.9 out of five stars. And I don't know if you realize how difficult that is to do. And what's even more difficult than that is I always look at the different ratings for one, two, three, four, and five stars. They give a percentage and you are at 93% five stars, which is identical to my book. Uh, this is very, very difficult to do. This is one of the highest ratings that you can possibly get as far as the uh, readers, the people that purchase the book, what they think of it. So my compliments to you. I know what kind of work that it takes to do something that comprehensive that gets that type of high rating. I uh, thank you so much for saying that because I sometimes... I make the mistake of trying to compare my success with other people's success, which belittles what I my own success. So I, I appreciate very much that you say that. Um, I do, you know, the Reddit community picked up on the book in 2021, about a year after it was published. And that really helped with getting reviews and purchases and sales, direct sales. And we also sold a lot of books through the publisher's website as well. Um, no, I, I do appreciate that, and uh, you're saying that, and it's it, it 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 is some work because you have to. It was also 2020 when the book first came out, so uh -huh. every every book fair that I had lined up, book festival that I lined up for the year to go to was canceled. So I, so it just came really came down to word of mouth and social media to be able to promote the book. So I, I do appreciate you saying that, and sometimes yeah, you as the uh -huh. author. It's never perfect. I, I think, though, if you do compare yourself to the other books, just take a look at the other books in your sector, your genre of, of books, and take a look at their star ratings, especially the percentage of five stars. And you're going to find that you are probably a long shot ahead of the second place book. Uh, it's it's uh, very interesting. So take a look at that sometime. But I, anyway. I will. I will. And I, I actually think that it's for, for the, you make a really important point and it's look, look at my genre. This is very niche for some people. This is post-trade processing. This is really back office things that most investors don't pay attention to. And so for that type of a book, the, those ratings and the sales figures are in, you know, puppies and kittens, <laughs> you know, it's in that category, right? It's yeah. in those, yeah, that category where people think it's going to be boring. But, uh, yes. you know, I think that what you've written is probably a very, very important book for investors to read right now. They need to know what's going on. So um, I've got uh, sort of some notes here. But first, can you tell us uh, some of your background, the important institutions that you've worked uh, for, and then the uh, relationships with other institutions that you've worked with? Yes. So I have worked in financial services my entire career. My first you know, sort of important position was at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And I started out in securities operations uh, where we dealt with uh, treasury bonds and um, cash. And then I was a, uh, an editor, the senior editor in the economic research department at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco at a time when the president there was a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee. 
the FOMC. So I was editing all of his briefing documents. So I really learned a lot about how the Fed, how the Fed works and how they come to conclusions about what their actions to take. Um, then uh, from there, I moved to the Pacific Stock Exchange uh, and I was actually worked in uh, clearing and settlement in post-trade processing. I started out as an analyst because when I went there, they were at a point of either a shutdown or a turnaround, either of which I think is terrific business experience. So I took that position and I, um, uh, it ended up being a shutdown. So they shut down clearing and settlement in San Francisco, which is an enormous and very important story all on its own. Um, and I, I ended up as vault manager during the shutdown so that all of the certificates that were stored in the vault there, this is 1987, 19... So you're talking about stock certificates and such. The Stocks evidence and bonds. And bonds. Yeah. So Stocks the actual bonds. physical thing, not just some digital representation. That's right, because this is 1987. Okay. And 1986, 87. And at this point, we had, like, we just took just the certificates representing Pacific & Co. That's the nominee name for the Pacific Depository Trust Company. It was probably six to nine feet, linear feet of certificates just to represent the shares that we were holding there. Uh, it was an enormous. Filing cabinets, is that what you're talking about? We had open shelves. Uh, with them, they would stand upright on open shelves with okay. dividers. Yeah, okay. Was, in file you know, and such. Yeah. Okay. And every certificate had to be endorsed from Pacific and Co. to CD and Co. in order to transfer all of the accounts from San Francisco to New York. To CD. To CD. To CD and Co. Yeah, C E D E C D okay. and Co. Mm -hmm. Can you explain because, that real quick? Yeah, so that's a nominee name for the Depository Trust Company. It's oh. a name that there used to actually be a book that you could get that had a list of all of the nominee names. And so the nominee name simply says, I, the Depository Trust Company, am holding this for someone else. So when the company wanted to pass out dividends, um, uh, pass out voting rights, they would know from that account name that this was that CD was not going to vote the shares, that CD would ultimately pass on the dividends to someone else because it was a nominee name. So the participants, the members had nominated DTC or the Pacific DTC, right, to, to hold those shares for them. So um, again, another amazing story that um, we ran these, so we, we had these uh, tricolored ribbons on uh, an endorsing machine. So we would run it through there with stamp Pacific & Co. on it, and that was the endorsement. And at one point, we were running machines so so constantly, like on 16-hour shifts, that, um, that the glue melted and the plates actually began to slip off of the machine. So before, there were a couple of vice presidents, a team of auditors from DTC, Depository Trust Company in New York, who had come out to take custody of all of these uh, stock certificates. And before they left, they asked me if I needed anything. And I said, yes, I need a job. So they hired me to move to, the, uh, to uh, go to New York. And I worked as the director of transfer agent services at Depository Trust Company. I started there right after the shutdown of the Pacific. Transfer uh, agent. Uh, transfer agent services, right. that to the audience, transfer agent. So every time when a company goes public, they have to keep track of who, who owns their shares for votes and dividends and all sorts of things. So they have, there are two people, and it's often the same company, but there are two roles that are played by what used to be banks, but are now big companies like ComputerShare. One is the registrar, and the registrar is responsible for making sure that the number of shares listed on the re registration, right, that are registered to, to investors, matches what the company is authorized and has authorized and is outstanding. That's a registrar. The transfer agent is the one who simply takes shares from Pacific & Co. and transfers them to CD & Co. So that's a transfer agent. 
generally speaking, they're one person. It's one group. It's like one company, but they're actually two separate roles. So the transfer agent is the one who's who, as I said, transfers ownership from, you know, John Doe to Jane Smith or from Merrill and Co. to Jane Smith or whatever it is. So you've got your the, the brokerage house, your transfer agent and the depository trust company are all right. these this uh, sort of chain of uh, custody that your stock certificates go through. So um, who actually has the stock certificates? Well, so you know, fast forward to 2024, and there are very few certificates left because in the 80s and the 90s, and especially the early 2000s, uh, the depository trust company made a big push to take everything electronic. For example, there have not been any new certificated municipal bonds issued since probably 1985. It's all done book entry only. Um, they're trying to move stocks in that direction as well so that there are, they don't have the physical certificates. The problem with the physical certificates, and you, I, I watched your, your video on that, the problem is getting one because they're Tell very dangerous. <laughs> right? yeah, it was exactly. a big problem. It's like almost and, a couple of months of work to get it done. And I Sorry. heard you say, and I've heard this story from so many people, I heard you say that... Um, uh, you know, you talked with the broker and the first person you talked to didn't know what you wanted and all these other things. Well, you know, they said, I'd never heard of such a thing. Who would who would ever want to take a certificate? What? You want what? <laughs> uh, well, well, you know, I've, I've never heard of this before. OK, can you hang on for a little while while I talk yes. to my manager and then I'm on hold for 20 minutes? He comes at, back and says, well, hang on some more. I've got to talk with the legal department. <laughs> he comes back. <laughs> And all he does is gives me a phone number for computer share and says yeah. they're the uh, that's the transfer agent, right? Computer share. Right. Okay. Yes. And, uh, well, they're, they're, they're one of, of hundreds of transfer okay. agents, but okay. they're probably the biggest. Okay. Uh, and he says, and uh, they can uh, do this for you and you know, you can get an account and so on. And I call computer share and they go, Oh no, no, no the brokerage house has to do this. Here's what you tell them. So I call the brokerage house and I'm teaching Charles Schwab how to do this. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> if I can make a comparison, what you did was equivalent to walking into Walmart, going up to the cashier and asking him uh, where, the, where, are the, uh, where are the warehouses in the state of California for Walmart. That's the equivalent, right? This is a back office operations kind of thing. It's getting these certificates. And you're asking a person whose job is just to take money and make records on books. Right. right but where does a novice that, you know, if you're a, a typical investor, where do they start? They, they would obviously just call their broker. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. They, think, they actually think that the broker is holding their shares. What is it that the broker is actually holding? Mm -hmm. The broker has an entitlement in your name for whatever shares you purchased. That entitlement is against the broker. So at that point, the broker stands between you and the company you're investing in. The company you're investing in has either you know, DTC or your broker's name on their records in nominee form, meaning they're holding it for <clears throat> they're holding it for Mike. And but your entitlement to the shares is an entitlement to the shares from your broker, not from the company. And that's why when you called computer share, they said, no, you have to call your broker first. Why? Because on the transfer agent's records, either DTC or your broker are listed as the owners. Wow. So, so I wasn't to see the owner as the owner until I actually took delivery of my shares, right? Right, right. And you could have taken them electronically through direct registration, but you can you can still get certificates. So it's OK to hold to send this back to computer share and keep it there. And it's still under my name only. Yes. It's not going to get borrowed and loaned to somebody who's going to sell it short. And it's not going to be uh, subject to any, um, uh, you know, priority. Uh, you know, who is the owner of this stock? And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so 
Right, so it's, it's you and only you, and your name is now associated with that number of shares. And instead of a certificate number, you now have an account number, right? And the yeah. one advantage of, say, having an account at ComputerShare is that all of your stocks are, are can be under that one account number. So under your one account number, you could have Xerox and Pfizer and Tesla and whatever else you wanted. But those... Look, I, look, I, you know, the, there are transfer agents who have done bad things that, that happens. But I will say this, if you wanted to invest in, I see your certificate is Tesla. If you wanted to invest in Tesla, then you should have some faith that Tesla has wisely chosen the transfer agent who's going to keep the records of ownership for them. Um, mm-hmm. There, there has been a lot of discussion on the internet about, you know, book versus plan when it comes to direct registration. The reason is that direct registration was not born whole cloth out of thin air. It started as employee stock ownership programs, right? And a lot of times they didn't actually issue a certificate for the employee. They just kept an account because every week they would add some shares, right? The person could, if I worked for General Motors, I could have them take $10, $100 a week or $10 a week out of my paycheck and buy me shares of General Motors. So they would hold those for you. Um, Then there was uh, a dividend reinvestment plan, which which was built on the the infrastructure, if you will, of employee stock ownership programs, where instead of getting a check for my dividends, my dividends can be used to buy more shares of that company and hold them electronically for me. And again, at this point, you don't want a certificate because now it's every, every quarter, like four times a year, Xerox pays a dividend. Well, if I'm in dividend reinvestment program, DRIP, then I would have they would have to send me a certificate for, you know, 4.37 shares four times a year. So they they add that electronically. Okay. Um, my role at DTC was as transfer agent liaison. So I was the director of transfer agent services, which means that I was a liaison between DTC and all of the transfer agents and registrars in the U.S. and Canada. There were, I think, a thousand people worked at DTC when I started, at least 500 of them. Their job was just to deal with certificates, taking deposits, make withdrawals. They, I was attached to the troubleshooting department and there were, I don't know, 150 people there. And all they did was to work on problems created by the movement of certificates. So when the movement was made toward direct registration, where individuals could have electronic accounts. You, so you could electronically go from your broker to DTC to the transfer agent, and they send you a statement, your shares are now being held electronically for you. To make that happen, the DTC was thrilled about it because they didn't want to keep all those people working just with paper. The brokers were happy about it because they didn't have to teach that front office clerk that you called, what, what's the certificate and how I work with it. And also, they would get uh, they could, but they would get lost. So there was a I remember a time when a FedEx truck in somewhere in Tennessee caught fire, and there were certificates in there that were either on their way to DTC or on their way to the transfer agent, and they burned. So we wow. had to recreate everything that was in that was on that truck had to be recreated. A bond had to be posted to say that if the certificate shows up and someone tries to negotiate it, I hold the transfer agent and the company harmless because they're gonna give DTC a replacement. That was expensive. And then we had to wait for the new certificate to come. So it was cumbersome. It was um, dangerous in the sense of fires, floods, whatever. Um, The last big hurricane that, that hit New York actually flooded the basement at 55 Water Street where DTC used to store certificates. So many, many things could go wrong with that. So they were more than happy to have the transfer agent and, and the, the transfer agent and the investor come together. Right? They were happy to have that happen. And what they didn't realize was that once that investor got connected directly to the company, had the certificate, had their shares registered in their name, they didn't really need the broker anymore. And if they didn't need the broker, then nobody needed DTC. So 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 they but they were just so happy like that's how expensive it was to handle certificates uh that that they were just happy to get rid of it okay 
You know, I do want to say that the only mainstream stock that I own is Tesla. Everything else is private placements in in uh, the mining, you know, the metals sector, mining and exploration. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most of yeah, I'm a precious metals dealer, and I sort of believe in gold and silver, especially now. Can you tell us about phantom shares? What are they? How do they come into existence? Uh, and, you know, uh, what are the consequences of this? So the phantom shares is a term that um, uh, I, with Carl Hagberg and Ray Riley, who really taught me so much when I first got to New York about the transfer agent broker world, like the, the rest of what was happening outside of DTC, which was a, a world I already knew because I'd done clearing and settlement. Um, and we sat down in a conference room in New York, probably in, in 2004, and tried to decide what exactly do you call that share that's at the broker's office when it's either been lent out already because you have a margin count, or it's um, uh, it, the your broker got the felt receipt. So every felt to deliver, which I think most people who are interested in stocks and bonds have heard of, um, every felt to deliver results in a felt to receive. So what broker A doesn't deliver, broker B doesn't receive. If your broker doesn't receive shares, they just put an IOU in your account. So what do you call that? And the, some of the people we worked with wanted to say that they were counterfeit certificates. They were counterfeit shares. Well, the problem is that, as you have in your hand there, those certificates could be um, counterfeited. And there were, in fact, counterfeit certificates. Mostly, they were in bonds because they wanted big value. And mostly, they were traded in Europe. So a transfer agent would get a certificate in that they knew to be have been replaced. And they knew it to be a counterfeit. And so, the, so we didn't want to use the word counterfeit because it had very specific meaning. So that's what we call a phantom share. So a phantom share is, do you know this term, contractual settlement date accounting? No. CSEA. So, so it's a standard throughout the, globally, I think, throughout the, uh, the industry, financial services industry, contractual settlement date accounting, which means that by contract, on the day that you purchase your shares, T plus two, I guess it's still two, uh, on the settlement date, the broker takes the money from your account, whether or not they receive the shares from the seller. Hmm. Okay. That's a so really important point. So, that's plus what, two. so two days after you make the trade. Right. Uh, the broker takes the money from your account, yeah. even though they have not received the shares from the seller. And it could be a week or a month, or I've seen cases where it was a decades later, that you go to reconcile things and realize that you never got those. The broker realizes that they never got those shares. Wow. So what is that? It's a phantom because it doesn't exist. So that's why we call it. That's why I call it a phantom share. It's the share that the broker puts in your account. And that, that is the security payment. entitlement that you're seeing in your account, right? That's the security right. entitlement. And it could or it may or it may not be a phantom share. Right. Okay. And for the audience, just the simplest form of a creation of a phantom share that happens every single day is if you've got a margin enabled trading account, you have agreed that the broker can go into your account and borrow your shares without telling you uh, right. and then loan them to somebody else who sells them into the market short. And now that person has uh, a security entitlement uh, on their platform, and you've got a security entitlement on your platform of the exact same shares. Am I correct? Um, it's uh, it's not quite right. Uh, okay. You do have, in that scenario that you just described, you, the first investor whose shares have been loaned, you do have an entitlement, not a share. Okay. When that share is loaned, all of the rights to dividends and voting go with it. So oh. when the short seller borrows that share and delivers it to another buyer for settlement, that buyer gets a real share that they can then loan to someone else. So that now becomes a phantom and the next person gets the real share, right? So this, oh. this 
just string of this string of relationships is what is so damaging to the to the the access to capital for entrepreneurs. And if you're dealing with small mining companies, you probably have some sense of this already. Yeah. Um, the more common way that you end up with an entitlement is that it's just a fail to, failure to deliver. So the broker who sold shares to your broker fails to deliver shares for settlement. Why do they fail to deliver shares for settlement? Uh, my dog ate my certificate. Um, I uh, oh, I meant it was to be short and it wasn't. Uh, it went, and I, I marked it along by mistake. Um, oh, I can't deliver the shares because the person I was going to borrow them from has backed out. And now, you know, so they have something called a daisy chain where one fell creates another fell creates another fell. So uh, so there are a multitude of reasons. But the National Securities Clearing Corporation, which is the part of DTC that clears trades and that does the calculations for who owes how many shares and how much money. They report to the SEC, and the SEC releases the data every two uh, two weeks worth of data every four to six weeks. It's it's a bizarre sort of a delay, but um, but they release a list of the companies and how many shares were failed to deliver on every settlement day. All yeah. of those failed to deliver because that means I didn't even borrow the shares. If I borrowed a share and you have a margin account and all that, okay, yeah, that, that happens, right? But these are fails to deliver where no shares were borrowed, no shares may have even existed, and yet I, the, the, the selling broker failed to deliver shares to your broker. That means that your broker got the failure to receive, just the other side. So DTC uses uh, double entry accounting, for bookkeeping, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It means that every debit has to have a credit. It's just double yeah. entry. So you can't add shares to one place without taking them from another place. So DTC has to keep track of who failed to deliver and therefore who failed to receive. So that failure to receive is going to sit in the individual investor's account. It sits in the money manager's account, the fund manager's account, because they don't know the brokers don't tell anyone except institutional investors that they have not received the shares that you paid for and that they have already taken your money for. So they get to hold your money and not and only give you phantom shares, entitlements, uh, for what should be never more than 35 business days. But I can say I've seen examples where decades have gone by and these settlement failures have never been closed. So uh, for the consumer, it's trade plus two days for settlement. Right. For, for the brokerage houses, it's trade plus two decades. Yes. <laughs> oh, but they take your money on trade plus two. Exactly. They just don't give you your shares in the shares. trade plus two decades, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you tell us about uh, Lehman and uh, if if you think that the creation of phantom shares and failures to deliver uh, may have been a factor in their failure. So I don't have any inside information on this, but I have decades of experience in the industry. And in my view, Lehman had so many fails to deliver on so many settlement failures on their books that, that the Federal Reserve Bank could not find a buyer to take them. Because remember, and how Merrill. Long, how, and, how long were they looking for a buyer? Well, they had probably. I mean, they knew they knew they were in trouble in 2007. Like Bear Stearns and those funds and Lane Rose, they knew in 2007 that they were in trouble because of everything that we just talked about and worse happened in the mortgage-backed securities. Right. And that's what really tanked everything. But but this issue of you know take your money and give you nothing was happening. At Merrill, it happens at Goldman, it happens at all of them. So remember, that was a shotgun wedding between Bank of America and Merrill, and Merrill Lynch. And Bank of America is wedding with Bear Stearns as well, right? Right. Well, and that's what the Fed was trying to do. And I was at the Fed when Drex, uh, I was in DTC, I was in already in New York when Lehman went under. So I watched that process there. 
But I was in um, at the Fed in, in San Francisco during the, it was the Mexican debt crisis. There was oh, some yeah. debt crisis that I was there. And I know that they have these sort of midnight meetings where all the bankers are called to the Federal Reserve and sit in a conference room and let's bang this out and figure out exactly how we're going to fix it. That was how Bank of America and Merrill Lynch had a shotgun wedding. They went through the same process, I'm sure, with for Lehman Brothers, but no one would buy it. My uh, supposition, my theory is that no one would buy them because there were so many fails to deliver. There were so many settlement failures in there and such really trash uh, securities obligations and entitlements that no one felt they could they could fix it. In fact, Lehman went bankrupt in 2008 and in 2016 and 2017, the depository trust company was still carrying a, a, um, a note in the financial statements about how we're how we plan to close out the Lehman obligations. So you're talking about and, nine years later. Yeah. Yeah, and it was just the the um, uh, uh, CIPIC. Um, they just closed the records on Lehman, I think, like last year or the year before. So this is a really this is this gives you an idea of how serious this problem of entitlements, and phantom shares, and failures to deliver. How serious this problem is, and how it can get so bad that a you know, what we used to call, a, you know, a white shoe company like Lehman Brothers. I mean, they were old school bankers uh, could end up where no one would even, no one would touch them. No bank, no broker would merge with them to help close up this uh, this gap because it was just it was just too big. Wow. So mm -hmm. uh, these phantom shares may have been the cause of the Lehman Brothers collapse. I mean, that's a, within the realm of possibility. Absolutely. I know Dick Fold sat in front of Congress and said that they were going bankrupt because they couldn't access capital because of the uh, short sales, because their, you know, their stock was being short sold. So the price was going down and therefore they couldn't raise capital, um, which certainly happened to them. I'm not, I can't deny that that happened to them. But I'm saying what I'm saying is the reason that the, the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury could not find a buyer for Lehman was because they had so many phantoms. No, but nobody, no one, no one wanted to touch it. And it was, it was fairly common knowledge on the street that, that this was happening to them. They had a lot of mortgage-backed securities also, and you've got a special name for a mortgage-backed security. <laughs> Tell us about the special, the, the uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities and why you have a special acronym for them. Right. So a mortgage-backed security is an MBS. Uh -huh. And there was a bankruptcy judge in California that uh, two of them, uh, Boyko and I can't remember the other fellow's name, they actually uh, published a paper, an article stating that they believe that one third of all of the mortgage backed securities, all of the MBS, did not even have mortgages behind them. So that's why I say that they were more BS than MBS because there's no M, just BS. <laughs> I think that's hilarious, but uh, you know that is it, what it, came it close is. To on the global financial system. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it it is it is amusing, and in fact, the kind of the bright side of that story is that because the mortgages weren't put with the bonds, when the bondholders after Lehman collapsed, and bondholders went to bankruptcy court to try to get the house that was. They had a mortgage that was in arrears, that, that mortgage was supposed to be part of the bond. When they went to court, the courts awarded the house to the homeowner because the bondholder could not prove a lien against the property. And that's why I say there was no mortgage, just BS. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I want to thank you so much for this interview. It was great. And I want to uh, urge everybody uh, to go, your your publisher's uh, website is spiramus, S-P-I-R-A-M-U-S dot com. And right. that is one place where we can, where uh, listeners can get your book, viewers can get your book. And, um, and then it's also available pretty much everywhere books are sold, right? Right, right. And yeah. uh, we also have the, um, for Naked, Short and Greedy, there's an audio book which is available on Amazon and iPods and 
or whatever that whatever Apple calls their 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 platform. Uh, so there's an audiobook for Naked Short and Greeting uh, that that came out in 2020. Uh, this year, uh, 2024, we released A Decade of Armageddon, which is a summary of which explains why I say it was BS and not MBS. All of that is in this new book. It's available on Amazon and all those, also from a publisher. But there's a special offer at the publisher's website that you can't get elsewhere. And that is that we're doing a limited edition hardcover version of Decade of Armageddon, and all of which will be signed by me. And those are only available through the publisher. But you can get the paper book or the Kindle version or a PDF version from, from other sellers as well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you. This has just been awesome. Uh, is there anything else you want to say in closing? Um, I don't. The only thing I want to say is something that I've, I've started using more when I, when I sign books, and that's that we need to learn from the past to overcome the chaos around us today and that's coming tomorrow. And that if we ignore all of the things that happened, you know, before we were born or before yesterday or before, you know, the, the mean stock tragedy in 2021, if we ignore all of that, then we're just contributing to the chaos. But if we look at what's happened, for example, in 2008, all these problems with entitlement, phantom shares, um, you know, bonds with no mortgages. If we look at all of that, we can at least be aware and be watchful of what of what's coming in the future. Okay, you know, uh, one last question. Do you okay. see any good outcome to this? Is there any way out of it? I will say yes, because especially today, I'm feeling very hopeful. Um, the, the first book I wrote, Lessons Not Learned, that I wrote for Spiramus, Lessons Not Learned, I tried to do a like a very positive chapter at the end to say, and here's what you can do instead of using banks and brokers. It talked about local vesting and things like this. Um, but the but the naked short and greedy has a very, you know, what they call a um, it, it just has a very sad ending where I don't see anything happening. But today I was listening to the um, hearings, uh, uh, some uh, seminar uh, out of Brussels about shortening the settlement cycle to T plus one. And time after time after time, all of their regulators, industry groups, um, investor groups, all kept saying that you've got to pay attention to the impact this is going to have on the individual investor, what I call a household investor, what you know DTC and others would call a retail investor, but the household investor is also a voter. And there's the more attention that's paid by regulators and banks and brokers to what to the impact they're having on the household investors, there is a solution there. And Europe right now has it front and center. It's on the radar at Parliament. It's on the radar at their clearing and settlement organizations. Deutsche Bourse is talking about it. They're all talking about the fact that what we do here today to move to T plus one is going to affect all of these people. And they recognize that these household investors are the backbone of deep liquid capital markets. If we if we stop putting new money, we meaning you and I and the, and the organizations that, that we support, if we stop putting new money into the market, then the banks and brokers will have to face up, all, face up to all of the, the chaos that they've created. And if we stop giving them new money, then the music stops and that's when, when their world falls apart. So I am a bit optimistic today, especially as I say, I'm paying attention to Europe. South Korea is doing a lot. The U.S., uh, of course, we're, you know, the biggest, deepest capital markets, most liquid, et cetera, et cetera. I, I get that. And all these other organizations look to us for models. Uh, but I think that what's happening in Europe right now could be the blueprint for our way out of all of this in the U.S. And that's what that's what they're looking at as well. They're looking at fixing this in a way that individual investors are still have trust and faith in the markets themselves to be able to continue to operate in them. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I want to urge people to just uh, take a look at uh, you know, the, the book on Amazon and on, on uh, spirits.com. And uh, and 
consider buying it. So <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Okay. I, suppose I, should, I suppose I should say that by my book, right? <laughs> At some point, <laughs> I, need, I need to just say it. <laughs> it's yeah, well, all in there. It's it all in like there. It's, yeah, it's important information to learn right now. Uh, yeah. There there could be something very nasty right around the corner. And uh, you w want to make sure that uh, you're not holding a securities entitlement to which there was no delivery. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And you're welcome. we'll see you next time. Okay. Next time for sure. Thank you.